You're listening to Talking Threat Intelligence, a podcast dedicated to uncovering the new challenges of today's threat landscape. Each episode, we connect with some of the world's leading practitioners to share stories from the front lines of corporate security. And now, on to the show. Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Talking Threat Intelligence. I'm your host, Robert Value. And my guest today, second time on the podcast, is Kyle Baker, product specialist here at LightGraph. Kyle, thanks for coming back on the show, man. Hey, Robert, thanks for having me back. I'm, I'm ecstatic, thanks. Now, Kyle, you have a bit of an interesting role here at LightGraph. You're often the ones that gets to show off our services to new prospects or consult with a lot of existing clients. So as a result, you kind of get a peek into the security operations of a lot of different organizations around the world. And I think that's given you a bit of a unique perspective into seeing you know, what works, what doesn't work when it comes to applying OSINT to corporate security. Last week, you sent me, I was looking for one mistake that we could talk about for this episode. You sent me a great list of mistakes that you see a lot of GSOCs making when it comes to applying OSINT. And I thought, wow, this would just be outstanding content for our listeners. So for this episode, I just kind of want to give you a bit of a soapbox to discuss these issues. Uh, folks at home, this might feel a bit of a rant, but I think Kyle has some really, really good perspectives here. So why don't we jump in? Sounds great. Yeah, when we you broke this topic with me, I think you opened up a can of worms. And uh, once it started coming out, it didn't stop. So <laughs> absolutely, we'd love to talk about this. All right. All right. Let's start with mistake number one, expect an easy button. What do you mean by that? A lot of organizations, large and small, expect a single person to be able to take a tool and monitor the entire globe's worth of threats. Um, it's just not possible. So they expect it to kind of have a single post for every event or alert that comes through. They want that in real time. So they want a first alert for every single event around the globe, regardless of, of kind of the topic. A tool like that just doesn't exist today. There are some great AI tools out there that have made a lot of advances, but there's nothing just quite that simple that you can just plug and play and have a single operator uh, eight hours a day assessing that kind of information and just having smooth alerts all of the time. I think the very savvy prospects that we have in the industry might be a bit cynical, a bit of vendors. And so they kind of not expecting the kind of easy button fix. But yeah, sometimes just this one magic piece of software that's going to solve all of our problems. Yeah, I know I worked with one organization that they've been looking for two and a half years for the correct platform that would cover their vast kind of global footprint and the wide amount of issues and use cases they were looking to cover with a single tool. And they're still looking um, two, <laughs> two and a half years in. So understanding that, that you may need a combination of tools, you may need a, a combination of skill sets and users to process this information, some finished intelligence, some unfinished intelligence, monitoring social media, as well as getting some curated alert feeds, is combining all of that together to give you the most complete picture. Yeah. And I think like from, from my experience in the industry and seeing our competitors or just seeing other kind of partners that we've and all the different vendors in the space, some, you know, everyone's got their strengths and weaknesses and putting that kind of collage together or uh, is usually the best solution at the end of the day. Let's move on now to mistake number two, too reliant on AI, third parties or verified feeds. Yeah, so I just mentioned AI has come a long way and is still coming along, but it's not perfect. So if you're reliant on an artificial intelligence algorithm to push out every threat to your executives, they're going to miss threats. The way the English language is constructed, it's very, very difficult to train a machine to pull out those kind of needle in a haystack threats that may not be quite clear or direct, but still pose a major risk to your executives, to your staff, to your headquarters. So just relying on too much of that, uh, you're going to miss things. You also may get false positives from that AI. So they may be pushing you things that are irrelevant and start to waste some of your time. So the more customizable you can get those feeds, the better off you'll be a combination of AI to get you some first alerting and cover off those things. And then some more raw data that you can go through on your slower time or have a junior analyst kind of reviewing some of that content to flag up anything that they deem may be a risk that the AI may have missed. That human factor is never going away. A machine's never going to fully replace human review. That's interesting. Do you have any kind of interesting examples where you've seen AI go a little bit off the rails, perhaps? 
I, what I see more often or hear about more often is AI missing content. So that I think that's more of a risk than it bringing in a lot of false positives. You can delete alerts, uh, ignore alerts, mark them as read quite easily. But what you can't do is recover a missed post after an incident. If somebody says they're going to show up and do something and they show up and do that thing and you have not captured that pre-indicator and it was out there, there's no coming back from that. So that's where I more often see AI causing an issue and being a pain point. All right. What about uh, third parties or verified feeds, which you also kind of included in that answer? Yeah, so relying strictly on verified information, that's going to cause a delay in the time of the post or the time of the event to the time that you receive that. If you're only looking at verified data, you're waiting for that verification process to push that through. Third parties, that's another thing that I see a lot. And we have a lot of clients coming to us that are currently using third parties that are looking to bring things in-house and build out an in-house corporate security department. So the reason for that is third parties just it's very difficult for them to understand the full landscape of your business and the full needs and requirements that your organization has. So unless that third party is kind of implanted directly in your security operation center and is given full access to all of the kind of issues that your organization may face and those different challenges and gaps that they may have, then they're may not be properly or fully utilized in the right way. Whereas if you pull those services in host, you can train your analysts and teach your analysts the true business needs. A deep understanding of why you're monitoring and what you're monitoring for is essential in this industry. And that's hard to communicate and relay to those third party agents sometimes. Well, it's just hard too. And you know, if you're a third party analyst with like a couple of different clients that you might be working with or a whole bunch in some cases, you know, just to have that develop that business expertise, which can only come when you've been working in the industry and getting the chance to talk to network with other people in your field to get that sense of the business. That's exactly it. A lot of those third parties are covering multiple industries and multiple clients and juggling those all at the same time. So just having it in-house, you have that focus on your corporation, your industry and their needs. All right, let's go a bit down the list again. Uh, mistake number three, too reliant on finished intelligence feeds. Yes. So some organizations get a daily roll up or a weekly roll up of security events that happened in the last week, industry trends. Sometimes a day is too late. Sometimes that is far too much of a gap to wait for that kind of finished intelligence. They like to tell the story from beginning, middle and end. A security operation team, they want to respond at the beginning or before the beginning of an event. They want to staff appropriately. So just reading what happened after the fact, you can plan for next time, but you're missing the opportunity to respond more quickly to that current event. All right. Number four, and you have some interesting examples with this one too that I want to dial into, not refining their feeds. Yes. <laughs> this is a little bit particular to... Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but this had a big, long rant in the middle of this whole list. So this was the one I was very excited to dig into. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is, is pretty particular to social listening is what we focus on a lot. Refine your feeds. Uh, if your alert fatigue is real, alert fatigue happens... Your analysts will feel it. You don't want to monitor every single post that's mentioning Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. There's too much content out there. You need to refine that. You don't even want to monitor every post that's mentioning Elon Musk and a threat term. You need to take some tactics and uh, some decision making on what are the most actionable threats that you can monitor for? What is the correct terminology that would indicate that somebody is actually going to do something and not just kind of a 14-year-old uh, tweeting from their parents' basements uh, inappropriate death threats? So just understanding the differences in those language, the difference in, in the type of way that people talk, looking at your content, looking at your feeds that are coming in, and identifying trends that are not threatening in nature, not the type of intelligence that you're looking for. One example that we see often, since we do work with exact text matching, keyword matching, is the term die. A lot of people want to know if their executive is mentioned alongside the word die. Seems for, reasonable. For obvious reasons, <laughs> yes. Uh, if somebody was saying die next to my name, I would want to know that as well. So if somebody says, I hope you die, I want you to die, you're going to die, directed at one of your executives, one of your employees, 
this is important. Obviously, we would want to pick this up. I was working with a financial company whose executives were frequently mentioned in German articles. I, they were headquartered out of Germany. And when I looked at their feed, it was 50% German content that was 100% uninteresting and absolutely not threatening in nature. They said that DAI was too important of a threat term to remove, but they weren't able to monitor their feed efficiently because DAI in German is the. So there were two approaches that we could take to an issue like this. One, exclude common German terms, things like und, das, financen, for those financial articles that are coming out. And that would eliminate the vast majority of that German content that was coming back in their feed. This was an English language threat query. So they could still use their German threat query to monitor for those direct German threats. They obviously wouldn't have die as a secondary term in that case and eliminate a lot of that German content from their English data set. The other thing that we could suggest would be to expand the term die into phrases. So instead of just looking for the word die, look for it next to terms that that would most typically be near. So you die, to die, should die, will die, and be exhaustive with the ways that you think that people may use that term in a threatening way. So between those two approaches, we were able to eliminate almost all of the German content from that feed and give them back probably about an hour of their day that they would spend the kind of reviewing and cleaning out some of those false positives from their feed. Now I get that would be pretty boring for any analyst just going through a bunch of random German financial articles that has either they're very unpopular in Germany or that, that's just a boring <laughs> job going through all that. <laughs> Definitely a, a red flag that something was wrong there. All right, moving on to mistake number five, not automating at all. Yeah, so humans can only do so much. There's only so much that a manual person can do. So although at the beginning I spoke about the importance of human review and human intelligence, human analysts, they only have so much time in the day and you only have so many resources that you can apply to that monitoring. So the method that we recommend, kind of my mantra recently, is automate where you can search manually where you cannot. So where you can monitor, where they do give you that kind of accessible data, those complete data sets to assure that you are receiving all of that relevant content coming back. However, there are places out there that are much less complete and much less giving with their data. Currently, places like Truth Social are a huge challenge to monitor. Um, they're app only. They don't push their data out publicly through an API. They're not being indexed by the major indexers, by Google. So retrieving that data, that's difficult to automate. That's something that has to be a manual process of logging into the app, searching for relevant key terms, and reviewing the content that way. So that's exactly what I mean by not automating at all. I'll automate everything as much as you possibly can, because that is going to save you time and give you more time to look in those places that you cannot automate, that you still have to schedule schedule manual reviews. One of the themes that you kind of said in, in your answer so far is striking that balance between automation and that human touch. Which side of the spectrum do you see most clients failing one way or the other? There are some clients that are strictly automating and they don't do any manual searches. So they have a lot of blind spots out there of places that just aren't able to automate. As I was kind of speaking to earlier, some corporations accept that. That's a risk threshold that, that they're okay with not monitoring and not applying those resources to. We are an automated platform. So our clients are absolutely automating to some degree, but the ones that are, are doing it best are also accompanying that with manual review, both in the monitoring side as well as the investigative side of things. But there's still an element of manual searching and manual review that may return more intelligence, more valuable data for you uh, as part of your investigation. All right. Moving on to number six, retention of data. Yes, I have a very specific instance in mind for this one that is why I wrote this one down. So there was an organization that was a user for of ours and a huge benefit of Navigator is that it does retain all of the data that it does collect. 
they had the ability to track all of the posts that were mentioned within their subreddit and collect and store that data for the review. They don't have to monitor it. They don't have to alert off it, but they can track that so that if there was something after the fact that they needed to go back and say, was this user speaking in this channel, um, looking into a deleted account or a deleted post, they still have that data to go back and reflect on. They also had the ability to collect posts based on key terms, and they could do this quite broadly. So you could pull in every post that's mentioning your brand and headquarters. That's a really common place that, uh, that security operations centers want to protect. It's going to impact their headquarters. That's typically a, a primary goal of a security operations center. So just collecting and retaining that data gives you a data set to review, to analyze, to assure that you're not missing anything in kind of your alertable feeds, your threat feeds, when there is a, a threat term mentioned alongside your brand and your headquarters. So in this case, they reached out to us after the fact and said that there was a direct bomb threat made to their headquarters in their brand subreddit. And they wanted us to pull that post for them and help them find that post. It was already deleted. They weren't tracking their subreddit. They didn't have any broad collection set up around their brand, around their headquarters, around their locations. There was no way for us to revive that post from the dead. It was never pulled into our platform. It was removed from the original source. So it, it was gone forever into the ether. They don't know what the username was that posted the threat. Somebody reported it socially and said that they saw it online. And they verbally said that to their manager who flagged it to the security team to go back and investigate. They could see where a post was deleted that had some interactions with it that they assumed was the post, but they could not see the text and they could not see the author. So collect and retain that data. You might need it in the future as part of your investigations. And having a tool that can help you automate that collection and retention is extremely helpful. Retention is also very important as you're investigating. You want to make sure as you uncover their pages, you uncover their intelligence. I think investigating 101, you document that as you go. You are taking screenshots. You have a, a Hunchly type platform that's recording your path and recording the evidence and collecting that for you as you move through. So the first thing I would do if I thought the FBI or a secure corporate security team was looking at one of my social media feeds, I would delete my account. Take and, it all down. <laughs> yeah, I would pull my blanket up over my head and I would shut everything down. I would put up as many kind of walls and privacy settings as I possibly could. And that's what a lot of these, these accounts of interest, these people of interest do as soon as they have some Twitter regret, as soon as they think that somebody may be looking at their page or that they may receive some backlash from what they've posted. A lot of people wake up the next morning and regret kind of the rants that they wrote online and they may come and remove those, but they still have those grievances that can bubble up into an action. So most threats start with a grievance. So capturing those grievances and tracking those and following those uh, before they bubble up into an action, into a threat is I think very important. Well, just anything that's usually interesting to a corporate security team, any kind of threats like that is usually the stuff that's going to instantly violate any social media platforms policies and get taken down right away. Any moderator is going to be, no, that's not good, which is good for the health of their platform, but not necessarily good for your organization with uh, keeping track of what's going on online. Yeah, that's a great point, Rob. It might not be the user that's removing that. We're seeing more and more restrictive policies on that threatening content, more reactions to reporting content, and then having the platforms themselves take that down. So you're absolutely correct. All right. Wrapping it up with mistake number seven, be sure to watch the hidden corners of the web. What do you mean by that? And when I say that, I don't want to devalue the importance of monitoring some of those mainstream platforms. There are a lot of true valid threats coming from those places. However, one Chan post, one post from gab.com, one bit shoot video may be worth a thousand YouTube videos um, as far as the kind of percentage of threatening or negative content that is in those places, depending on who you are and what your brand is. That's where, where conspiracy theories first start to bubble up. If somebody's saying that your executive is on Jeffrey Epstein's list, that can cause security concerns, PR concerns, uh, a lot of negative backlash. So 
catching those types of things quickly is really important. And where those types of rumors typically start are the darker, harder to monitor places of the internet. It's the Chan boards. It's the alt social anti-censorship forms that allow and encourage people to participate in these types of conversations. So when I say hidden corners of the web, that's more so what I'm talking about is those places that are darker in nature, places that I wouldn't want my kids utilizing and kind of looking at, at the type of general content that is in those areas, the non-mainstream platforms. So I spoke earlier about the Reddit bomb threat to a headquarters that was reported because it was a mainstream social platform that an employee was just casually scrolling through because they like to see what conversations are happening about their brand and about their industry. You're less likely to get those types of reports on Chan boards, on Gab.com. So and you're also less likely to have them flagged up from PR departments or, or other kind of social media monitoring departments, because they're also not typically looking at some of those hidden corners. And then there's the dark web itself, the onion router, the Tor browser. So you may be missing conversations from that because you don't even have, you know, you have no way to monitor that content. You're not going to download the Tor browser and just casually peruse uh, some of those sites. Having a method to monitor those and a way to check those consistently, I think, is becoming essential as that landscape of the internet, that section of the internet is growing more prominent. We've seen with the last several active shooter incidents in the States, there were pre-indicators on some of these more nefarious places, on Discord servers, on Telegram channels. That's what I'm talking about when I say kind of hidden corners of the web. One of the keywords there that I kind of clued in there was uh, the type of sites that you wouldn't want your kids on. And I was just thinking about you got a whole new generation that's coming up and they're on a totally different group of social networks than, than what we're on or what the generation after us is on. Every kind of generation seems to have its own group. So its own suite of platforms that we tend to spend most of our time on. And so that's probably naturally where you might be inclined to, to start looking for threats online, generally those kind of mainstream places. But the social media world is also constantly changing. People keep migrating to the new services. So I'm always thinking about trying to keep an eye on which ones are up and coming because the ones that I'm on every day aren't necessarily the ones where the threat actors are necessarily on or where the next generation is necessarily hanging out. Exactly. And if you look at the kind of recent Texas school shooting, his indicators were on a platform called Yubo, which is directed towards teenagers. It's a teenage platform. So that's not one that I, I would ever have thought of or uh, utilized myself. It's new, it's emerging. It's almost like Tinder for teens where they can swipe and make friends and they can host live streams to try to form some groups and meet new people that way. So yeah, it's, it's those new places, those emerging emerging elements that we really have to keep our eyes on because that's where, where the new generations are going to shift their conversations to. Mm. And it kind of gets into building out your team. I'm just thinking that's popping into my head is the importance of staying diverse on your team, just because you you need all those people that are looking in their own kind of echo chambers to kind of bring that into the meeting and say, hey, you know, I'm hanging out on this site. Maybe we should be monitoring that or, or all those to kind of different perspectives. And that's absolutely a trend that we see in the security industry as well. They are diversifying their staff. There's more women, there's more ethnicities, there's more different cultures, there's more age groups within the security operation centers. And that only makes your team stronger. All right, Kyle, let's uh, take this thing home. What's the main takeaway you want listeners to remember from our conversation today? Don't be afraid to admit your mistakes. Don't be afraid to take an honest review and look at your social monitoring program at your security operations center. And don't be afraid of change. The landscape is constantly changing and we need to constantly be changing to keep up with that. All right, Kyle, thanks again for being on the show. Thanks so much, Rob. It was a pleasure. Again, that was Kyle Baker, product specialist here at LifeRaf. Thanks for listening to Talking Threat Intelligence. Never miss an episode by subscribing to the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever else you listen to episodes. And if you'd like more insights on building a successful threat intelligence program, be sure to check out our resource page at lifebraffinc.com slash blog. That's lifebraffinc.com slash blog. And I hope you tune in next time.